Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Beter. Today is September 12, 1975, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 4. As usual, there is a great deal more going on right now than meets the eye. The major media mislead the American people daily simply by presenting only those portions of the truth about events that add up to produce a desired impression. Thus you can't hope to grasp the true significance of news events unless and until you learn to analyze the scanty facts in the news for yourself. Learn to separate fact from opinion. You are not given enough real facts to come to your own clear-cut logical decisions except perhaps in the area of sports. Instead, the gaps are filled in for you by commentary designed to lead you to conclusions that are not really your own. This is why I'm trying to open your eyes to the way things really work and to give you key information that you need to have. To this end, I want to discuss the following three topics today. 1. The International Monetary Fund Gold Sale Agreement and the dethroning of the United States dollar. 2. Assassination politics and subtle maneuverings in the countdown toward dictatorship. And 3. The rapidly out merging outlines of the planned 1977 war in Asia. At the end I also hope to mention some brief hints about what you, the individual, concerned America, can do to help stem the tide and save our beloved land. Topic No. 1 In my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 2 for July 1975, I discussed the setback which David Rockefeller experienced at the June meeting of the International Monetary Fund, or IMF. Speaking through his agents in the United States Treasury, he had expected to succeed in persuading the member nations of the IMF to sell all of the IMF gold and was ready to buy the IMF gold as soon as it was sold. Much to David's surprise and chagrin, he failed in June 1975 because of French opposition. Based on their own awareness of the true status of Fort Knox and America's gold reserves. As I mentioned in that AUDIO LETTER, the Rockefeller interests went to work in a feverish search for a means of achieving their objective, that is, a decision to sell IMF gold at the next IMF meeting in September this month. And if you paid any attention to the news early this month, you know that this time the Rockefellers did achieve a hasty compromise agreement. In a moment I will explain exactly what was decided about potential gold sales at the early September meeting of the IMF, but first I want you to notice the startling quid pro quo which the Treasury accepted on behalf of David Rockefeller as the price of selling the IMF gold. For years now the United States Treasury has been debunking the monetary role of gold as obsolete, barbaric, and no longer needed. In this connection the Treasury has been fighting for years to bar central banks from buying gold on the free market. The reason for this is to allow the interests controlled by David Rockefeller to corner the gold for themselves while they del their deliberately produced runaway inflation ruins the rest of us stuck with paper money that has no backing. But at the September 1975 IMF meeting, this position which the United States has stuck to uncompromisingly for years was suddenly abandoned. Why? 
What was it that made the United States agree to let central banks buy gold? They already had the right to sell it. What caused such a total defeat for David Rockefeller and such a dramatic reversal of a fundamental policy built up now for years? My friends, what caused the result is the spreading effect of our exposure of the Fort Knox Gold Scandal. The general American public still doesn't know about it thanks to the news blackout imposed by CBS, ABC, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and other major media which are controlled and intimidated by the Rockefeller Brothers themselves. But the most knowledgeable people in the financial community here and abroad increasingly do know that something is very fishy indeed about the United States Treasury Department. In short, the heat is on. Since we revealed the existence of the Central Core Vault in July and explained its role in the gold theft and fraud at Fort Knox, the Treasury knows that we know exactly what they have been doing and how. The conspirators know that if my associates and I ever are allowed to present our evidence in a court of law before a grand jury or in a congressional investigation, their fate is sealed. Their game, therefore, is to try to keep that from happening by keeping the public fooled and unaware of the truth. To this end, the Rockefellers made their big concession at the September IMF meeting in order to get some IMF gold returned to the Treasury. Under the terms of the agreement, 5 million ounces of IMF gold is to be returned to the United States from whence it came. This gold was originally promised for sale to the insiders within the Rockefeller circle. But now they want it instead to display or use it in gold auctions to keep the public fooled. In this connection, on August 21, 1975, shortly before the latest IMF meeting, the Treasury even held a well-publicized meeting with private gold dealers to discuss the question of holding auctions. This was pure propaganda and bluff, and intended to lend weight to any future auctions of gold obtained from the IMF. The frantic maneuverings to snatch some IMF gold for propaganda auctions is simply a replay of what they did last December to have a little gold to auction off. On December 9, 1974, the Treasury illegally emptied the tiny exchange stabilization fund of its 2 million ounces of gold, as I have mentioned in previous tapes. That was done simply to have something for the Treasury to, to sell in small propaganda auctions, since the rest of our gold reserves were long gone. With this important perspective in mind, Listen, please, to what the IMF did on August 31, 1975, at the beginning of their so-called September meeting. 1. The widely publicized gold sale agreement of the IMF is an agreement in principle, a conditional agreement. The IMF is to meet again in January 1976 in Jamaica to discuss the exchange rate question. If and only if IMF members agree on that in January, then the conditional gold sale agreement, which has just been announced, will take effect. The stakes are so high for David Rockefeller and his partners in crime that I predict agreement will be reached at the January meeting in Jamaica. The political will is there. The IMF gold will then be officially released. 
although I am informed that steps are already being taken now behind the scenes illegally and prematurely to take possession of the 5 million ounces of gold and put it back in Fort Knox. By the way, there have been rumors lately that Mrs. Mary Brooks, the Director of the United States Mint, has tendered her resignation, but that it has not yet been accepted because it would look so bad. There are indications that her superior said, in effect, quote, Just hang on for a few more months, Mary, while we get this whole thing about Fort Knox out of the way. Then you can go if you like." Unquote. Be that as it may, we had one of our sources contact Mrs. Brooks, and here is what she said, quote, There is nothing amiss at Fort Knox. I was there recently. I have never tendered my resignation, and I don't intend to do so. I don't know why these rumors keep coming up. Unquote. Asked if she knew about the rapid retrieval elevator system to the Central Core Vault, she did not deny it, but just replied, quote, Those kind of rumors come along all the time. Unquote. Our source suggested to Mrs. Brooks that it would be a simple matter to open Fort Knox wide open to prove Dr. Beter wrong, and quote, put an end to this matter once and for all." Unquote. Her reply, and this is her exact reply, and I quote, Oh no! It would take weeks! Unquote. All I can say to that, my friends, is, Yes, Mary, it will take weeks to get the 5 million ounces of gold back in Fort Knox. That is why I am informed there is some activity going on right now in Fort Knox. Meanwhile, Mary Brooks is trying to brazen it out. Returning to the IMF Gold Sale Agreement, though, I should point out one other thing. Should there fail to be an agreement about exchange rates by the IMF in January in Jamaica, an unlikely event, then we will be back to square one on IMF gold sales. Should that happen, David Rockefeller and his fellow insiders will have used the IMF gold sales decision as a scare tactic throughout this fall of 1975 to run down gold prices and take all the gold they can out of weak hands. Also, they made billions of dollars going short. When the public becomes aware of this, gold prices will start up again. Number 2. The Interim or Conditional Gold Sale Agreement specifies the following. Of the approximately 150 million ounces of gold now owned by the IMF, one-sixth or 25 million ounces is to be sold on the open market or to member central banks. The latter is what will actually occur. True to Rockefeller tradition, by the way, this IMF gold sale to suit their own purposes has been painted as a philanthropic move to raise money to aid poor and developing nations. Another one-sixth or 25 million ounces is to be returned to member nations of the IMF in proportion to the amounts of gold each nation originally contributed. Each nation may then keep or sell this return gold, but you can bet they will keep it. Their own citizens will hang their central bankers if they don't. Under this clause, the United States is to receive about 5 million ounces, worth about $700 million at current market prices. This amount, I'm informed, has already been promised uh, to the insiders, but events may undo this when the Fort Knox gold scandal breaks nationally and worldwide. It is this 5 million ounces of gold, equal to only about 2% of what the United States Treasury officially claims to have that the conspirators want desperately to get their hands on in case they need it for propaganda auctions or even another carefully staged peep show at Fort Knox. 
The remaining two-thirds of the IMF gold, or about 100 million ounces, is to stay put in the IMF for the time being. They, uh, there it will remain as backing for the so-called Special Drawing Rights or SDRs of the IMF. The SDR is to become the new International Monetary Unit or Standard of Measure, the yardstick, and then the other strong currencies that now make up part of the basket of the 16 currencies which constitute the SDRs will be the reserve currencies of the future, at least for the next two years. The dollar, therefore, is giving up its sovereignty as a sole reserve currency. The joker in this deck is that over a half of, a, of an SDR is made up of the American dollar and British pound sterling, both of which lack gold backing. In the tremendous inflation ahead, the SDR will therefore be hobbling around on one leg with its only real support consisting of the strong gold-backed currencies which comprise less than half its face value. Number 3, and very important, beginning January 1976, the IMF members have agreed not, repeat not, to fix an official gold price for a period of two years, provided the January 1976 agreement on exchange rates take place. This is exactly the development I have been warning about for over a year based on information from my own confidential sources. They are behind schedule in obtaining this agreement, but the agreement itself is precisely on track. Once it is in place, they can easily make up for lost time in their plan to visit economic catastrophe on the United States and the world. What the IMF agreed to in principle is to allow its members, including the United States, to ask their respective governments to abolish the official price of gold, which is now $42.22 an ounce. Once the exchange rate agreement is reached in January 1976, this means that for the following two years there will be only a market price for gold, subject only to supply and demand plus massive massages by the Rockefeller interests to cause the price of gold to skyrocket. In other words, gold will be going private for two years starting in January 1976. The gold zoom signal of $180 an ounce, which I explained in my audio book recorded in October 1974, will be penetrated, and cataclysmic inflation and economic chaos will erupt. After two years of this, with the economy of the world and especially of the United States in smoking ruins, David Rockefeller, the man who orchestrated the whole thing in the first place, presently plans to call an International Monetary Conference to at last restore gold to its traditional monetary role. David's plan is to officially repay gold then at $2,000 an ounce, 20 times the current official price of $42.22 an ounce. Number 4. After the two-year period just mentioned, according to the gold sale agreement just reached by the IMF, central banks will be allowed to buy all the gold they want. As I have already pointed out, this complete reversal of a key feature of the Treasury's long-standing gold debunking campaign is directly traceable to the steadily building pressure of the Fort Knox Gold Scandal and the desperate need of the conspirators to keep it covered up. Number 5. Until January 1976, no sales of gold will be made by the IMF to world gold markets or to central banks at market prices. It would not yet be legal to do so, but I fully expect that agreement will be reached at Jamaica in January and that IMF gold sales will then take place according to plans. Thus the United States dollar is now way overvalued. The United States Treasury is most anxious, anxious uh, to get its house back in order, in appearance at least, to prevent the public from becoming aware that Fort Knox is truly empty of its gold. The Treasury now holds less than 800,000 ounces of gold 
a mere pittance left over from the 2 million ounces it illegally took from the Exchange Stabilization Fund on December 9, 1974. The rest was used for the propaganda auctions by the Treasury in January and June of this year. Gold fever will spread across the land in the near future as soon as the full significance of the IMF action is widely understood, and then the only questions will be not the price but the availability of gold. The gold market today is very thin as it is, and the insiders had to scare the weak sisters in order to make them disgorge their holdings. As of now, David Rockefeller still plans for gold to be pegged at $2,000 an ounce and for the new SDRs to be the standard un unit of measure. The United States dollar will lose its status as a world currency reserve. Even now David Rockefeller's Chase Manhattan Bank is already linking some of its loans to SDRs. After all, who should know better than David that dollars are to be avoided? For the next two years after January 1976, those countries having gold in their central banks will be able to enjoy a fast markup in the value of their gold reserves of 20 to 1. Can you imagine? 20 to 1. Therefore, during that period, central banks will buy up at market prices the 25 million ounces that will be for sale by the IMF. That gold will never reach the private market, private gold market at all. But the United States has been deliberately made gold poor by the Rockefeller Brothers. Having no gold left of any significance, we are now in the same leaky boat as Britain. And look what is happening to Britain, which is already on the road to advanced socialism, cataclysmic inflation, deepening unemployment and social and economic upheaval on the way to dictatorship are in store for all of us soon if the gold situation is not rectified. And so, my friends, we are in a race against time. David Rockefeller and his collaborators in and out of the Treasury seek delay, delay, delay. They want to use the IMF gold and other tricks to keep the American people fooled until it is too late. Time, unfortunately, is on their side. Those of us who would like to see our nation saved, on the other hand, are pressing with every means at our disposal for a full, open, honest investigation of the whole thing without further delay. In this connection, I want to read some telling words from the front page of the Daily News Digest for the week of September 1, 1975. Their address, by the way, is Post Office Box 27496, Phoenix, Arizona 85061. The headline is just one word, Why? I now quote, The Fort Knox Gold Story is far from dead. There's something rotten and the stink has spread across the land like a fog. Thousands of readers have followed our series closely. Like them, we have waited in vain for satisfactory answers to questions raised by Dr. Peter David Beter and his associate Ed Durrell. An exchange of letters with the United States Bureau of the Mint has produced nothing but double talk. The key question regarding the Central Corps vault still remains a mystery. Is the gold there or isn't it? Why is it so difficult to send a delegation to Fort Knox, open the vault and reveal its content or lack of content? Why have no members of Congress taken it upon themselves to settle this matter? It's courage such a missing virtue in Washington that this can't be or won't be done? Why, have, <clears throat> why has the nation's press avoided the story with an intensity that is amazing? Is this not perhaps the biggest news story in the civilized history of the world? It certainly has that possibility. An evil group of individuals that can loot a nation's treasury, as has been charged, to the tune of $11 billion certainly deserves some attention, doesn't it? 
and the radio and TV industry didn't even mention the initial charges and covered only the peep show staged at Fort Knox last September. But the newspapers, where are they? Why the blackout on a Fort Knox story? Is there some powerful force that scares them into submission? Or would they lose so much advertising that they can't run the story? Or do the major editors think the story is so outrageous as to merit no attention? Outrageousness certainly didn't prevent Jane Fonda and others from getting front page coverage. Yes, something stinks. Is the gold there or isn't it? Which of our Congressmen has the guts to find out?" Unquote. Finally, Here's an item for you to think about if you are tempted to swallow the Rockefeller propaganda about the swaggering economic power of the Arabs and oil-producing states. On September 5, 1975, a reporter posed the following question to Dr. Abdul Rahman Latiki, Minister of Finance of Kuwait at the National Press Club. Quote, None of the oil-producing states spoke during the World Bank and IMF meetings. Why not? Unquote. Dr. Atiki answered, quote, Addressing people seems to be of no meaning. If the United Nations or World Bank meetings had a time to listen exactly as good listeners should, everyone would speak. But most of the speeches just go into the air. Nobody hears it, whispering, most of the delegates out of the room, and then it is a text in a book. If it happens, Sometimes somebody reads it. This is why. And secondly, it is known who runs the policy of the monetary system of the world, and we cannot for the time being compete with them. We are in their hands. So this is a fact. We have to live with it unless we break through, and we are looking for that time." Unquote. His answer met with knowing applause. It expresses not only the predicament of the oil-producing nations, it expresses yours and mine as well. And now Topic No. 2. On September 5, 1975, in Sacramento, California, a dress rehearsal was held for the assassination of our figurehead President, Gerald Ford. A young woman named Lynette Fromm got to within two feet of the President before being stopped by a Secret Service agent. As she was bundled off by the Secret Service with a look of horrified surprise on her face, she reportedly shouted, It didn't go off. The very next day the news media were filled with the entirely predictable conclusion of officials connected with the case. Miss Fromm, they assured us, had acted alone. The possibility of a conspiracy, that dirty word, was quickly pooh-poohed and discounted. True, she had been given the gun by someone else, but that couldn't mean anything. And yes, her landlady did reportedly say that just lately Miss Fromm has suddenly started paying her rent uh, with $100 bills, but that can't be anything but coincidence. To give due credit to the officials involved, though, it should be mentioned that some of them did become predictably excited about one thing, namely the often stated need to disarm the populace under the banner of gun control. One official even ranted that this is so acute and so immediate as to call for, quote, wartime measures, unquote. Well, everybody, it so happens that the incident on September the 5th was not intended to injure President Ford. On July 17 and 18, 1975, I said in a speech at the Santa Monica Civic Center in California, and I quote, By September 1975, 
we will know if Rockefeller is to be stopped. Some very important developments are in the making." Unquote. By this I was referring to the all-out power struggle that is now going on out of the public view, and the potentially decisive importance of this month, September 1975, in the Rockefeller timetable for dictatorship in America. This power struggle, though it is well hidden from the general public, is escalating to the vicious level of assassination politics which burst onto the American scene twelve years ago with the murder of President John F. Kennedy. Assassinations have been a, a recurring part of the American scene ever since, including those of Dr. Martin Luther King, Robert F. Kennedy, and recently Jimmy Hoffa, among others. And this volcano of violence threatens to erupt yet again now as rival factions within and close to the Rockefeller camp jockey for position in the dictatorship now forming. Last month, by the way, in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 3, I revealed for the first time the truth about how and why President Kennedy was killed. The response to my comments on that subject has been so overwhelming that I believe the following footnote is worth mentioning here. As you will recall, I revealed last month that President Kennedy was riding in an elaborately rigged limousine the murder car. He was killed not by a sniper, but by a well-aimed blast from inside the car. That blast was in all probability set off by a radio signal from outside the car by someone in a position to tell just when to do it. My confidential technical sources now believe they know where the radio signal came from. If you have followed the various accounts that have come out about the JFK assassination over the years, you have probably heard of the mysterious man with the umbrella. This was an onlooker who was right on the scene of the shooting in Dallas. Reportedly he abruptly raised his umbrella and opened it just as the President's car went by, and at that moment the several snipers all began firing. After a few seconds he is said to have closed the umbrella and put it back down, and the firing stopped. He then melted into the crowd and quickly vanished. Others have theorized that the man with the umbrella was the signal man who used the umbrella to coordinate the firing of the snipers for maximum confusion and effect. I believe this is correct, but based on my own confidential information, I believe he also had the additional role of sending the radio signal to set off the fatal blast inside the murder car at the height of the den from the snipers. The upraised umbrella would have made a perfect radio antenna to transmit the signal, and the signal itself could have been triggered with a button on the umbrella handle. It was important, though, to avoid focusing suspicion on the murder car itself, which was destroyed within 48 hours. Therefore, an ordinary umbrella looking like the one used by the mysterious onlooker was no doubt left somewhere nearby for people to find, while the real umbrella equipped by the CIA with a tiny radio transmitter, was spirited away. When the ordinary look-alike umbrella was found, discarded on the scene, the natural reaction would be to say, Look here! I guess the guy with the umbrella got rid of it, it so it wouldn't hamper his getaway. And that would be that. At any rate, 
We stand on a threshold of a possible new era of assassination. Intimidation and misinformation of the public even worse than that which followed the Kennedy assassination. The September 5th dress rehearsal for Ford's assassination was for two purposes. First, it was to give him a not-so-subtle hint that he had better fulfill his deal with Nelson Rockefeller and vacate the White House soon or else. Second, it was staged on camera, you will notice, for the benefit of you and me, the public. This incident is a part of a multifaceted campaign to condition your mind to accept the departure of the Fords from the public scene one way or another. Witness, for example, how CBS, which is thoroughly under the thumb of the Rockefellers, set up Betty Ford as a clay pigeon on the August 10, 1975 CBS television show 60 Minutes. There Betty Ford bared her private life and thoughts in public in a way which has brought down ridicule and shame on her head. In this and many other ways the Fords are being belittled in the public mind so that our first appointed President won't be missed when he is replaced by our second. Yes, the behind-the-scenes power struggle which has so far kept Nelson Rockefeller from seizing the Presidency, which he had planned to do by June three months ago is beginning to erupt into the open. What we are witnessing is the latest phase of an elaborate multi-step coup d'etat with its major milestones spaced roughly a year apart so that public apprehensions will largely die out between steps. Just over three years ago the coup d'etat began with a broader gate break-in. Two years ago Vice President Spiro Agnew was eliminated from the scene. This activated the 25th Amendment, which Nelson Rockefeller had manipulated into a Constitution several years before to be used in the planned coup. Just over one year ago Richard Nixon became the first President in American history to resign, the victim of Watergate which was conceived by Nelson Rockefeller, engineered by his CIA, and given a final assist in the form of blackmail by Nelson Rockefeller's longtime agent, Henry Kissinger. Now it has been another year, and it is time for the next step, namely the ousting of figurehead Gerald Ford from the White House so that our President, in fact, Nelson Rockefeller, can make himself President in name also. And Rockefeller must do this soon because he is becoming more and more unpopular by the day. If this is accomplished according to plan, the coup d'etat itself will be complete. After that, there will only be one step left to go, our ratification of Nelson Rockefeller's status as our dictator on Election Day, November 1976, just over one year from now. On that day we are to return our then incumbent President, Nelson Rockefeller, to the White House, and at the same time we are to accept by national referendum the new Rockefeller Constitution which has already been written and which will give him a nine-year term as our first dictator. Every possible avenue is being pursued in order to pave the way for this bicentennial death of our Republic. Not the least of these preparations involve the conditioning of your mind through the massive controls over the mass media exercised by the Rockefellers. For example, various component provisions embodied in the secret new Constitution keep
popping up here and there, seemingly at random, but actually as parts of a well-coordinated master public relations war being waged on the unsuspecting American public by the Rockefellers. To cite just one example, and they are everywhere these days if your eyes are open, there is the article in a recent issue of Business Week entitled, quote, The Big New Push for Federal Chartering of Corporations, unquote. Business Week, as should be mentioned, is published by McGraw-Hill, one of the hundreds of major companies under Rockefeller control. McGraw-Hill is a particularly useful voice for the Rockefellers since it publishes a series of special industry magazines which established high prestige long ago and are therefore very influential now. Anyway, the article says that there is a rapidly emerging push to replace state chartering of corporations in America by federal chartering, and that surprisingly some of the most powerful backing for this move is coming from leaders of major corporations themselves, such as General Electric. The article fails to point out, though, that all these big corporations cited are Rockefeller outfits, and federal chartering is one of the keystones of the corporate socialist economic structure spelled out in the new Rockefeller Constitution. The impetus for this big new federal chartering campaign is stated to be a couple of Supreme Court decisions which may look, quote, conservative, unquote, on their face since they effectively removed the federal influence over corporations that had long been exerted through Rule 10b-5 of the Securities Exchange Commission. This ruling looks at first glance to be a move away from federal meddling, but its actual purpose is to whip up sediment in Congress to pass legislation which will go much further than the old SEC rule. This is a perfect example in which the real purposes of political actions is the exact opposite of the surface appearance, and if anyone doubts that the Supreme Court is knowingly being guided to do the Rockefeller will, just consider, for example, our Chief Justice Warren Earl Berger. One of the ways in which he established the credentials which led to his Supreme Court appointment was through his contribution as a so-called outside expert to the writing of the secret new Rockefeller Constitution. The idea to eliminate the right of trial by jury, which the new Constitution does, came from Berger. The art of politics, as it is practiced at the national level today in America, has been reduced to continual deception and trickery. A perfect example is the plan which has been concocted by Nelson Rockefeller and his longtime friend and supporter George Meany to recast Rockefeller's image in a conservative mold. Imagine! This has become necessary because it is now the conservatives who hold the balance of political power in America. No doubt you've noticed the wide publicity which has been given lately to the supposedly conservative views which are preached by Nelson Rockefeller these days in his speeches. Never mind that his entire public career for more than 40 years is a sordid history of well-documented but little-known piracy against the American ship of state. Never mind that he has always espoused, quote, fiscal integrity, unquote, and that without exception this has been translated into higher taxes, increasing public debt, swelling unemployment, and mushrooming welfare roles. And never mind that his public career is littered with broken promises and double-crosses. 
He now says things which the Rockefeller-controlled news media label conservative, so we are to take them at face value. But many Americans will not be taken in by Rockefeller's own statements alone. So going along now on a parallel road as a fellow traveler is one George Meany. Meany has lately made a great show of not letting the longshoremen in his AFL-CIO load wheat bound for Russia, supposedly until the American consumer is protected against inflation and whatnot. This stand has been painted in the news media as evidence of conservatism on his part, but now that this political harvest has been reaped, the grain is being loaded once again and sent on its way to Rockefeller's Mother Russia. Just to enhance this conservative image, Meany is also throwing snide remarks at Henry Kissinger. Kissinger has now done his job for Rockefeller and is about to be thrown to the wolves so as to appease the conservatives and to fool them into thinking they are gaining ground. Thus Meany is building a conservative, anti-Communist image as fast as possible, and since he is not a self-serving politician, this apparent development of a conservative streak will be taken by many as genuine. He will therefore be in a perfect position when the time is ripe to throw his arm around Nelson Rockefeller and give him his full political support. Rockefeller will thus be transformed into an instant conservative, anti-Communist, anti-Soviet in the eyes of many trusting Americans. One of the most diabolically clever and cruel twists in this plan has been the way in which Nelson Rockefeller, through his agent George Meany, used exiled Russian author Alexander Solzhenitsyn to further his own political plans. Very few Americans grasp what happened, and Solzhenitsyn himself has no inkling at all of the treachery that surrounded his recent visit to the United States. Solzhenitsyn is a true and great Russian patriot who has suffered terrible things at the hands of the imperialist Communist regime that now enslaves his people. He would never have knownly permitted himself to be used by the very people who perpetually finance and sustain the Russian Communist Police State, but he did not reckon with the craftiness of the Rockefeller Brothers. Meany said in his introduction to one of Solzhenitsyn's speeches under AFL-CIO sponsorship that Solzhenitsyn is, quote, a voice that demands to be heard, a voice that will not be denied." Unquote. The Rockefeller approach to anything they cannot suppress is to harness it, and that is what they did to Solzhenitsyn. They harnessed him. First, the United States Government agreed with Russia not to accord him any official recognition before he was released. Hence the widely publicized snub by President Ford. Next, George Meany latched onto him even before he came out of Russia and sold up a commitment from the famous Russian exile to speak under AFL-CIO auspices in the United States. Then when he reached America, his great AFL-CIO speaking tour consisted of only two speeches, one in Washington, D.C., and the other in New York City. As a result, Solzhenitsyn's actual words, which I believe every American should hear, were heard by very few people. But the fact that he had spoken under George Meany's sponsorship 
was publicized nationwide in the Rockefeller news media, and this explains why the New York Times gave it broad coverage. The net result, a few people heard the truth from Solzhenitsyn, but vast numbers of people were deceived by all this into thinking George Meany deserves the conservative label now being stuck to him by the Rockefeller public relations machine. A more convincing lie would be difficult to imagine. I now turn briefly to Topic No. 3. In my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 3 last month, I revealed that major revisions are in the works for upcoming war plans. These changes uh, stem from the actions of Indira Gandhi to stop the Rockefeller takeover of India by way of their CIA. The Rockefellers want to absorb India into their empire before proceeding to World War III and are therefore modifying their foreign intrigues accordingly. Their plans I revealed some time ago for World War III, which is really to be half a world war with America as the main battleground, have not been abandoned altogether. They have simply been put on a back burner while the focus shifts to India, which is the last remaining chunk of the old British Empire that is not yet in Rockefeller hands. The emerging build-up to war in Asia, which is now targeted to start about March 1977, according to the Rockefeller plans, is a complex thing and is being largely ignored by most observers right now. I plan to speak more about it in upcoming AUDIO LETTERS, but I feel you should have at least a thumbnail sketch, sketch now. To begin with, the Helsinki Accord signed recently by Ford, Brezhnev, and leaders of more than 30 other nations had only one real effect. It formally ratified Russian conquests in Eastern Europe regardless of all the official protestations to the contrary. That's why Soviet Party boss Brezhnev had tears of joy in his eyes after all had signed it. It gave Russia a secure border in Western Europe, and the ink was hardly dry when Russian attention turned eastward to China. Well-orchestrated attacks on Peking and the foreign policy of Chairman Mao have appeared not only in high-level organs of the Soviet press, but also in Soviet satellites such as East Germany, Bulgaria, and others. Russia fears that China might become the leader of the third world of developing nations. Therefore Russia is trying to encircle China and has been greatly helped in recent years by the Kissinger foreign policy which has handed over Southeast Asia to Russia, not to China as some people think, and which has effectively neutralized American influence elsewhere along the Chinese encirclement perimeter. The encirclement threat to China in turn is giving impetus to the forging of a Sino-Japanese axis which is forming right now. Finally, this whole situation and its tensions are such that the Rockefellers hope and expect to turn it to their own purposes. Through their thorough control of Japan, an avenue is readily available to guide events toward precipitation of the planned war against India on schedule. This is especially so since John D. Rockefeller III, the real ruler of Japan today, learned all about such things long ago when he helped maneuver the Japanese into attacking Pearl Harbor. Finally, once India is attacked, Russia will enter on India's side and America will be used as a factory to supply Russia. The Rockefellers stand to make lots of money through their involvement on both sides, as usual, and they expect to pick up the pieces in India after the smoke clears. And so, my friends, on and on it goes, unless we stop it. More and more people are now asking, what can I do? 
I plan to say more about this in the future, but let me just give you these brief hints for now, if I may. First, you must inform yourself. Know what is going on so you will know what, it, what needs to be corrected. Second, inform others and never think anything is too small to do. Talk to a friend, a neighbor. Write a letter to the editor. Third, put pressure on your elected officials locally and at the state level as well as Congress. Call or write again and again and again and again until they learn you mean business and cannot be shrugged off with routine, polite, meaningless replies. Finally, be specific about what you want your elected officials to do to straighten things out. In this regard, I strongly recommend that you focus your energies on the Fort Knox Gold Scandal. Those who have perpetrated this fantastic crime and cover-up are now running scared behind the scenes. The Fort Knox Affair is the one most dangerous issue for the conspirators who are trying to trap us all in a dictatorship. So do all you can to help us break it into the open so that the truth can be proven. Until next month, then, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and God bless each and every one of you.